right, what's up bakers? In this video, I'm gonna show you how I feed and maintain my sourdough starter. I keep two sourdough starters, one made of rye flour and one mostly white flour, and I've been baking sourdough bread for almost 20 years. That's right, almost 20 years, I'm getting old. I also have this dehydrated starter from Jeffrey Hamlin that was born in 1980. If you don't know, Jeffrey Hamlin is one of the best bakers out there. I suggest you check out his book. I'll leave a link in the description below. Now, let's start with what is a sourdough starter. In its most simple form, sourdough is bread that's been made without commercial yeast with a natural wild yeast culture like this. So in my opinion, sourdough breads have a way better taste. They have a, definitely have a better shelf life and they have a better aroma. I love to eat them and I'm not against making yeasted breads, but sourdough is my true passion. On our grain, we've got three parts, the germ, the bran, and the endosperm. And on the outside of the grain, there's a microflora of wild yeast culture. When we mix that with water, it starts to ferment and we can continue to feed that to create our sourdough starter. And by feeding it, I mean we're adding more water and flour. The wild yeast is gonna consume the sugars in the flour and turn them into CO2, thus leavening the bread where you see those little bubbles inside the dough. As a part of the fermentation process, our sourdough starter is gonna produce lactic and acetic acids. When you smell it, you'll see what I mean. The acetic notes are like vinegar or nail polish, and the lactic notes smell sweeter and more like yogurt. Over time, you'll understand how to balance them and what you prefer in your sourdough baking because there's not one right answer. It's very trendy to buy sourdough starter or to talk about your 100-year-old starter, but in my opinion, the best way to do it is to make it yourself because you'll really understand the process. If you don't already have a starter, you can check out the guide on my blog and it's gonna walk you through the process. I'll also be creating a video for this channel and showing you how I do it at home without creating any discard. We're gonna talk a little bit about how I feed my starter, but keep in mind, the environment in which your sourdough starter is created is going to affect how your sourdough starter reacts. Whole grains contain natural bacteria and wild yeast on the outside of the grain. When it's milled, those organisms will get mixed through your flour. Once they're active, we need to feed them so they remain alive and begin to thrive. Let's talk about our sourdough starter and how I feed mine. So I've fed my starter over the years in hotels, back of cars, on vacation, all sorts of crazy stuff, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. To truly understand how your sourdough starter reacts, it can take years of practice, so don't get discouraged early on, just keep at it and trust the process. The more you start to understand the feeding schedule, the more consistent and better your bread will get. Your sourdough starter will also thank you for feeding on a consistent schedule. You can get really intense about it and track your water temperatures and times. For the most part, when I'm just feeding my starter, I leave it at room temperature. Now we'll talk a little bit about temperatures in a moment, but for now, just remember, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. If you bake as much as I do, you're probably gonna wanna feed your starter at least once a day, maybe even twice a day. And if you're baking, sort of on the weekends, you can store your sourdough starter in the fridge so that it has a little bit of a rest and pull it out, give it a few feeds before you wanna bake with it. For the flour I'm using in my sourdough starter, I have two sourdough starters as I mentioned. One is 100% rye and I use this for making whole grain bread. If I wanna make a whole grain bread, I truly want it to be whole grain. So if I use a white starter, there's gonna be a little bit of white flour in my bread. Now that's okay if you're just baking at home, but I try to keep it separate so that I can have that real whole grain loaf of bread. And I keep my white starter, it's a little bit sweeter, it has a different development of acids, and that's my sort of day-to-day go-to start. In my white starter, I use a combination of 90% bread flour and 10% rye flour. The rye really kicks up enzymatic activity and provides extra sugar to be consumed by your starter during fermentation. Now let's talk about how I have fed and maintained a starter for over 15 years. Close to 20. Whoa. For many years, because of how I learned, I thought that you had to let the sourdough starter ferment overnight. So I would mix it at night, and then in the morning I would mix my doughs. And I did that for at least a decade. And then the more I started to question and play around with it, I learned from other bakers that we can do longer feeds or shorter feeds, warmer feeds or colder feeds. The different amount of starter that we put into our feed is going to dictate how fast that starter rises. Now I hear this message all the time that people think they've killed their starter, but it's quite resilient. Um, I actually haven't fed this one in a probably about five days. It's just been hanging out in the fridge and I only pulled it out for this video. You can see it's quite liquidy, it's very loose. I've got my regular starter here that's due for a feed. And now when you look at this, you can sort of see, well, that it's got a great texture, it's kind of loose. Uh, it has a 
wonderful aroma and it's full of bubbles. And this is at the point where we wanna feed this. If you go a little bit over, that's okay if you're not actively baking. But if you wanna have a really solid bake, you need to sort of mix your dough when your starter's at its peak. And the only way to learn that is by doing. An over-fermented starter still contains wild yeast and bacteria, but not quite enough to leaven bread. But it's better suited for a discard recipe. Again, I'll leave a link in the description to some of my favorite discard recipes that you can find on my blog. If you develop too much acidity in your sourdough starter due to lack of feeding, you'll actually over acidulate your dough and the dough gluten network will start to break down and make your dough really weak. Our perfectly ripe starter will be shiny on top, have a little bit of bubbling on the surface and have a great aroma. You should also notice that your starter has risen significantly. When I first started out, I used to place an elastic band around the, the starter when I fed it and, an, and then I could monitor how much it's risen, if it's doubled or tripled in volume. A ripe starter also has a little bit of texture. It's almost like a thick whipped cream. It should stick to your spatula. You see that? Whereas my over fermented starter will just run off. So there's our over fermented runny. And again, I'll show you. Here is our nice one. And if you look closely, you'll see it hangs off the spatula, look, and kind of pulls off. Another trick you can do to see if your sourdough starter is ripe is to put a little, put it in some water and see if it floats. Now it's not always the best judge of ripeness, but it will help you understand if there's enough CO2 in your starter to leaven bread. So being a person that bakes a lot, I usually feed my starter twice a day, but you could definitely feed it once a day. My typical routine is to feed my starter before bed at a low inoculation, one part starter, 10 parts flour, 10 parts water, so let's say 10 grams of starter, 100 flour, 100 water, and that's gonna take between 10 and 12 hours at room temperature. My house is about 18 to 19 Celsius, and I know that overnight that'll ferment. The other way I like to do it is what I call a short or a warm build. So I will do equal parts, one to one to one, 100 grams of starter, 100 grams of flour, 100 grams of water with warmer water, something like 28 to 30 Celsius and that's gonna rise and ripen at about four hours. So if I wanna wake up and mix a dough, I can do one to 10 to 10. If I wanna mix a dough in about four hours, I can do one to one to one. Now for my schedule with kids, my mornings are really busy and I don't usually have time to mix a dough first thing in the morning. So I like to wake up, do my one to one to one, and that allows me time to prep, weigh my ingredients, start an auto lease, maybe cut the inclusions, cook the porridge, or whatever I'm doing. If your schedule suits mixing a dough in the morning, then you can definitely do an overnight feed. Keeping a daily logbook will really help you understand your starter. So if you write down times and temperatures that you fed it, it's really gonna help you track it. I got really nerdy over the holidays with a friend of mine feeding our panettone starter. That's a totally separate video, so don't ask that question yet. I will drop that at some point. Uh, and we had a Google Drive to track the temperature, the time, and the pH of the starter. You definitely don't have to get that intense about feeding your starter though. Now it's time to feed our sourdough starter. To feed our starter, we're gonna put the jar on the scale and tear it to zero. I'm gonna put in 10 grams of starter. Don't worry if it's not exact, we're just feeding overnight. And to the jar, I'm gonna add 100 grams of cold water. I'm using cold water because I want this to go slowly. I'm not baking tomorrow. 10 grams of rye flour and 90 grams of bread flour. You can play around with your flour ratios. This is just what's worked for me, but feel free to feed it something else. Take it off the scale, give it a really good mix. Make sure you incorporate all the dry ingredients, mix it up. It doesn't have to be smooth. Lumpy is okay at this point. And then we're just gonna scrape down the sides of our jar and smooth over. I'm gonna close the jar, uh, but normally I actually take that little seal off the jar before I do. It's not really gonna make that much of a difference, but it's a little better if you take it off. I hope you found value in this video of how I've been feeding my starter over the years. If you liked it, I've got more recipes and guides on my blog, and I'm in the process of doing a more beginner series for YouTube and the blog. So if there's anywhere you're getting stuck or there's anywhere you think I can help you, let me know in the comments. For now, I've gotta go feed my starter, and I'll see you in the next video.